Just checking my sound. Am I on? Am I coming across okay? Can anybody hear me? Yeah, <laughs> you can still hear me. <laughs> Thank you very much, Pastor David, for that uh, welcome. And it is a delight to be here, I must admit. Um, uh, it, it really, I don't know how to put it, but I, I'm not a pastor like Pastor David is, but I absolutely love sharing the word. Absolutely love it. And uh, you'll understand why during the talk, uh, why I'm so passionate about speaking and why I'm passionate about Creation Ministries International as well. Um, as, as Pastor David said, I'm, I'm going to present a talk that will incorporate some science, but let me assure you before you start getting worried, it is going to be at the most simplest level. Okay, I'm not going to get heavy with science and all that sort of stuff. It's going to be very, very simple. But I'm going to embed that in my own story um, because I was not uh, raised in a Christian home. So the talk tonight is actually building both the book of Genesis and creation into my own story. So that's why I've called it from evolutionist to creationist, which is a rather dramatic shift, is it not? To go from an evolutionist into creationist. So I am a, uh, as you see there, I have some qualifications from around the world. I, um, done a lot of other things as well, but just to give you a little bit of background first of all, before we uh, uh, get into the science and why that science is so important, particularly why the book of Genesis is so important to us. Let me introduce myself, and it's not working, why not? It's on the on. I'll turn it off and on again. There we go. Was that you or me? That was me. Thank you. <laughs> I've been in many churches where things have gone dramatically wrong. In one church, I was talking about dinosaurs, and it was at night time. And what happened? There was a massive explosion with electrical current and circuitry and all the rest of it as this uh, power pole went up in flames and everything else. So I had to continue the talk in the dark, and so I wandered around doing the... Uh, around the what really upset me, it did upset me a little bit, was when the lights came back on, I said, oh, now I can use PowerPoint again. They said, no, turn the lights off, turn the lights off. I didn't know whether that was a reflection of my preaching or <laughs> whether they just enjoyed that. But as you can see, I'm a scientist. That's not me in the past. That's a picture of me in the future. But I, why did I become a scientist? Why, and what sort of science did I particularly enjoy? Well, the science I did enjoy was to become an earth scientist. I studied landscapes, floods, sediments. I looked at some fossils and even published papers on microbes. Can you believe that? I published papers on microbes. And if you want to have words to me later, in, in a, uh, if you're concerned about the COVID, the person who detects COVID in all the sewerage around Australia is one of my old PhD students. So point your finger at me if you're unhappy that this person can identify an area as COVID-ridden and close it down. He was one of my graduate students. But why did I go into that area? A little bit of background first of all. Um, raised in a non-Christian home, raised in a violent home to that as well. So both parents, alcoholic, and then all the relatives basically alcoholic as well. A lot of violence was in that home. So I must admit that I was quite dysfunctional as a child. I still carry the scars on my body from that period of time. And um, I thought, okay, education might help me. At high school, I thought, this will be great. I'll, I'll develop an educational uh, background. I'll learn things and achieve things and so on. At high school, I was sent to a secular school, of course, not a Christian one because nobody in the family was a Christian anywhere. I was sent to a secular school, and I won't go into detail because there are young people here, but in fact, what you've heard about in the Christian schools is more rife by documentation in the secular schools. And I became a victim in a secular school of what you hear about in the Christian schools. And so by the time I was 18, I was completely dysfunctional. I had no idea what love was, what a relationship was. I could not communicate with other people, didn't know how to. I remember in my year 12 in New South Wales, a friend invited me down to his home and I sat there and in came his father and he walked up 
and his mother had a small tear in the eye because something hadn't quite gone right that day, he gave her a big hug, kissed her, I nearly fell off the seat. I had never seen husband and wife kiss at the, at the age of 17 or 18. Isn't that incredible? That's the family I grew up in, totally anti-Christian. So I went to university. Was I functional at university? Was I, was I clever? No. I failed the first few assignments and so on. Why? Because I, was, I actually didn't get into university. I'll be honest. I did not get a scholarship. I did not get admitted. What I did, I believed, I honestly believed, education was my future. I had to get into university. So I rocked up at a university in New South Wales, and I lined up in every queue, and they said, your name is not on the list. I was, but I have to be at university. Well, the tutors quickly organised a, a, a chap to be aware, and security to be aware, that this character was wandering around university demanding to be let into university. And I got a phone, I actually got stopped on the way out by an elderly man, and he said, tell me your story. I told him my story almost in tears. He rang me that night and said, I didn't mention to you, I'm the chaplain of this university under Act so-and-so, I'm admitting you into university. But you will have to pay the fees, unlike any other student. So I had to go and work in the steelworks. I worked very hard and, uh, uh, through that period. And uh, I eventually was able then to start passing. I learned how to study. I didn't mix with the other 18-year-olds who would go to the pub every day. I decided to mix with the old students who were 21 years of age. And to an 18-year-old, a 21-year-old is, is, is old. And uh, they taught me how to study. And out of that, I rose the ranks, became top in many of the courses, was asked to enter into the honours program in three different degree programs, and uh, chose to do so in landscapes and so on. Immediately, I thought I'd do a master's. That was rejected. I was placed into a PhD program immediately because I was driven. I was driven to study and to become the best. And so I did study landscapes and floods and so on. Now, immediately upon that, having got a PhD, I actually left the country. Why? Because nobody helped me while I was here. I'll be honest. In those days, we didn't have social security to any particular level. So nobody stepped in in the school where I was being abused. Nobody stepped in at the home of the extended family. And so I left the country. Why? I was trying to find out who am I? What is my identity? What is my purpose? And so I took off overseas. I spent 10 years in China at Chungman Daiho University. I had to learn a bit of Cantonese for that. Not Mandarin but Cantonese or Guangdonghua. I was in Finland for a number of years. That was great. I absolutely enjoyed Finnish men. They were so quiet and so uh, uncommunicative. They were just like me. Couldn't communicate. In fact, the fascinating thing with a uh, pastor, I went into a sauna in Finland, and there was a Finnish pastor sitting there, and the Lord blessed me with meeting many pastors in my journey. And he sat there, and in English, he said to me, Ron, because they roll the R's, by the way, Ron, you are a good Finnish man. I said, I'm a good Finnish man? Why do you call me a good Finnish man? He said, because Ron, we have sat here for one hour and you have said nothing. <laughs> because I couldn't. I was learning to connect with society, to connect with people, and so on. I didn't hold back where I was working. Did I work for Gaddafi in Libya? I did. Not as a, one of them bad guys. I was actually looking at water resources and the water particularly under Libya and how would it be sufficient to irrigate Libya. In fact, there's enough water under the Libyan desert to irrigate Libya, all of Libya, for 10,000 years. Isn't that fascinating? And I loved being in Libya. It was absolutely... They had Christian churches, they had Jewish synagogues, it's not what we thought it was. Now, was he a terrorist? Yes, he was, but it was for Africa's purpose, not for Muslim purpose, which is rather fascinating. I worked in Peru. Oh, I loved it in Peru, chasing the Amazon floods and all those sorts of things, and uh, learning a lot about those floods. And uh, oh, when I went there, it was a time of hyperinflation. So the menu didn't have fixed figures. They were constantly changing the figures on the board of the prices of the meal. 
And I remember arriving at the airport, or actually, yeah, the airport was interesting when I first got there. The machine guns were all pulled up because my camera was in the bag. And the uh, customs officer said, Senor, mucho problemo, mucho problemo. What is my camera doing in your bag? I knew what I had to do. I don't know how it got there. I'm so sorry. Here, please take it. That's how... It was. Now, I, I don't speak ill of them. They were absolutely in a state of total wreck as an economy and as people. And they needed all the benefits they could get. So how did I get a hold of flood data or anything else? I paid for it. US dollars was worth a fortune over there. So I brought my data all that sort of stuff. But I loved there. South Africa, enjoyed travelling through South Africa, looking at water supply and floods and landscapes and so on. Was I chased by animals? Yes. I was chased by an elephant once. Rogue elephant. I didn't like him at all. I was sitting in an open jeep and the driver said, sit still. I said, I'm not sitting still. Look at this, this elephant's charging us. I said, hit the accelerator. He said, no. I thought, are you kidding me? Just as the elephant got close, he put his foot on the clutch and pressed the accelerator and went <laughs> and the elephant then realizing that this beast was not going to run but going to fight immediately swerved and ran straight past me like that I was stunned he said see I told you we're okay we'll go on I said no we won't we need to go back to the hotel I need to get changed <laughs> was I shot at yes arrested yes did I fall into drains, knocked unconscious? Yes. Medivaced out? Yes. Bitten by snakes all over the place? Yes. Did I get diseases in those countries? Equivalent of Ross River fevers? Yes. Hepatitis? Yes. I loved it. Why? Because I was defining myself, finding out who am I and all of that. So there's a bit of background to me, non-Christian, but why did I not accept when I was travelling the world meeting Finnish pastors I was even in a Libyan church. In the Cook Islands, when I was there, I was taken to a church, and uh, I thought, this would be interesting. Beautiful singers in the Cook Islands. But I was tense, and an elderly man behind me could see I was tense, so he started to massage my shoulders and say, hey, bro, chill, relax, bro, hey, it's okay. <laughs> I nearly had a heart attack. But I, even, I met them all and they were planting seeds. I found out later that so many of them, after I left, prayed for me continuously for years. They were planting a seed. But why did I not accept our Father? Why did I not accept Christ? Because I had had a Father who treated me quite badly. Give him blessing. On his 70th birthday, he broke down in tears after I became a Christian, cried and said, I seek forgiveness for what I did to you. I was then at school where male teachers were saying, trust us, we're your, like your father. So when somebody came to me and said, there is a father you need to meet, I was not interested. So you can see now I was a very difficult case for the Christian world. But you can trust God always. He brings each and every one of us, gives us every opportunity. And he is extremely patient. And occasionally, as in my case, he has to go, do, 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 wake up, son. Find out who you are and why you're here and who blesses you and all the rest. So, that's my background. I travel the world studying landscapes and all these sort of things. And that study, over all those years, teaching evolution and in an, an, an atheistic model or, or a uh, um, agnostic model of doing so, I was stunned by the scientific evidence that I came across. And it took me 30 years as I travelled the world, but what I found was absolutely amazing. Let me share you with some of that. So I entered into this world after an education system where I believe that sediments, which is just, that's the biggest scientific word you'll hear tonight, sediments, it's just dirt on the move. So when you lose your garden, that's sediment now. Okay, it's dirt there, or soil now, it's sediment. If it's on the move, or landscapes are being changed, or eroded, or deposited, and fossils and so on, all, they said, pointed to evolution. And I accepted it, automatically, because that's the way you're taught. And they seem to give you hardcore evidence. But what did I see when I travelled the world? Well, I saw some incredible landscapes to start with. So I've called this part A, landscapes. What hit me was that the world has, on the surface of the planet, of the, of the land surface, 
70% of the entire land surface is sedimentary rocks derived from sediment. Well, that's extremely unusual. Where's the volcanic in more dominance? Where is the um, igneous in dominance? When we look at the other systems like Mars and all that, we find large igneous deposits everywhere. But we don't find them here. They're covered in a sediment brought down by floods, as we interpret them, plural floods. But more importantly, 40% of the planet is plateau, lovely and straight, like you see there, and multiple plateaus. And you look at that surface, and yes, you can see a ravine in there or a canyon in there, but the bulk of that plateau is flat. And somebody tries to tell me it's 300 million years old and it still stayed flat over 300 million years. And I start to question that. How can that be? Because even in arid zones, there is still erosion and sediment movement. Why is it still flat? As I continued traveling the world, here I am in New Zealand, and I love the sign to this particular landscape here. You can look at that slope there, it's steep, is it not? But do you notice it's also quite fragile? You may notice these particular talus slopes down here. That's falling material, it's just falling down from the top. So if I tried to climb that, what would happen? It would just collapse and I'd probably be buried under it. And then the sign says it's somewhere between 5 and 30 million years old. And I'm going, you are kidding me. Look at the angle and look at the friability or the, 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 uh, the, how easy it collapses. That cannot be. It's only a very short period because normally it would have simply become of lesser slope. As you travel the world, and this is the blessing I had, this is the blessing I had. I was traveling the world. So I wasn't listening to one person's story in one location. I was mapping it to other stories in other locations. And I started to see patterns that are not recognizable in one spot. And so as I travel the world, here I am down in Port Arthur. Uh, sedimentary uh, beds were there. You can see their lovely uh, parallel sedimentary beds. I've marked them there. You can see them showing there that all these lovely lines of sediment layers are put down, they will go on for thousands of kilometres and tens of thousands of square kilometres. Now, sometimes they will tilt and all the rest, but they're still in beautiful sequence. And they said, oh, that's floodplain sediments. I'm going, no, they're not. I've studied Amazon. We've dug up the Amazon floodplain. It does not look like that. A floodplain, in fact, from a sedimentary environment is one of the most chaotic environments because you have levee banks, oxbows, overflows, flood flow, all sorts of things mixed together to create chaos. That's not chaos. That is wonderful, uniform terrain. And so you look at the modern landscape today and you see this incredible, you know, undulation going on in our landscapes. It's all erosion, it's all falling apart, there's rilling, landslides, all these sorts of things. But when you look under the current day, what do you see? You see lovely level surfaces wherever you go. It's fascinating. So here's the question I began to ask, and I began to ask my fellow colleagues whom I was travelling with. There's the landscape, if you just look at the top there, there's the landscape today. Underneath, all around the world, we see it like that. But if we'd had a previous landscape, and if the sediment had moved and buried the previous landscape, then I would expect to see that. And you don't find it. So when you go to North America and 10,000 square kilometres, you won't find it, even though it's cut by gorges. So how did that come to be? Are you telling me that that sediment has been laid down uniformly over tens of thousands of square kilometres at a certain rate every year? I find that hard to believe, as I became an expert, rising the ranks, by the way, I did rise the ranks, I published extensively, I worked for the OECD, I became an international consultant, I became professor in three different co in continents, and I, I loved, I was rising the ranks, trying to be the best I could be, but I kept questioning these models that I was taught in my university days. Then you see these, what we call the mega rivers. Here's Katoomba, a good example of one. I put the yellow line in there to indicate it's a plateau. So by the way, the Great Dividing Range is a plateau. So we've got the escarpment, and then we've got a plateau tilting slightly backwards, going back inland. But then you see these massive gorges. Now I have monitored water and flow and sediment and storms. I have chased the biggest storms you'll come across on the planet. I have loved it. 
I've gotten into them. Yes, as I said before, I've been washed away, knocked unconscious, all the rest of it. But I managed to get into a storm. Have any of you seen, by the way, the, the movie on, on uh, Typhoon? Have you seen that one? It, it, it's, uh, it's when they, these, it's, these people want to study a typhoon in the USA. Or what is it? A, um, it's a, uh, sorry, it's a... Twister. Twister, yeah. The tornado. That's the word I was looking for. Thank you very much. You'll find out later why my words get confused. I'll tell you a little bit later. But a tornado. And so what would they do? They'd run in close to the tornado, leave all their scientific equipment, and then what they'd do? Run away. Well, in floods, you can't do that. You have to get in to get your samples. And that's why I got washed away and all the rest of it. I had one student washed away once, but he lived because he remembered my terrifying words. If you ever you go into that channel and a flood is on its way, if you survive it, you won't survive me. Because as your supervisor, you are not to get in that channel during a flood. But if you do, because I thought, no, 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 sometimes they do, what I want you to do is drift. You're going to be turned over like this, but you're eventually going to surface down there, and you'll see there's a bridge going across. I want you to cling to that bridge. Guess what? He went in when a flood came down with a two-meter wave, washed him away. As he rolled, he said, Ron is going to kill me. He is just going to forget this, this. And he did. He just relaxed until he got out, clung to it, and the SES came and got him. So today, I still have not lost a student, uh, which I'm very proud of. But the point being, we have monitored, well, I haven't, but we have tens of thousands of gauging stations around the world. We can tell you now, the river in that valley did not create that valley. If you don't believe me, go and talk to Charles Darwin. He stood in the very same spot. He looked at that valley and said that river could never, with the longest period of history and time, create that valley. It's too small. Not powerful enough. There's Charles Darwin saying it. We find them everywhere. We call them mega or misfit valleys. They're all over the planet. And then you have these other ones, which are what we call their water gaps. It's when a river comes up against a mountain range, shows absolute almost contempt for that mountain range, and just flows straight through it. Now, there are thousands of them all over the world. Unbelievable. That's the Fink River in the uh, uh, McDonnell Ranges near Alice Springs. No scientist can explain how. Despite all the publications in the journals around the world, they know their arguments are weak. It cannot be done. How is it possible that this happened? And then, what really caught me off guard, there's a boulder sitting on top of a plateau. Does that rock belong there? You can see it does not. It's a different geology to the rock surrounding it, all the, all the material around it. That's not just one rock. On that plateau alone, there is a billion, one billion of those well-rounded rocks. Now, where would you normally see those well-rounded rocks? You'd find them in river channels, in the base of rivers, particularly as the water smooths them. You can, in fact, see that they have been concussed and smoothed by water. That source of geology was 500 kilometres away. I'm sorry, but that rock cannot be moved, even by the biggest rivers, for a very short distance, let alone 500 kilometres. And a billion of them got rolled, and they're on top of a plateau. By now I'm going, this is ridiculous. Now, I started to say, this looks like a catastrophic flood. All of my secular scientists that I was travelling the world with said, we agree with you, Ron, but don't say it aloud. You will lose your job. So, where did that lead me to the first point? Just the landscapes alone reflected a global flood. Did that make me a Christian? No, because I still had issues with my upbringing and my educational system. But then we look at the second part. We look at sediments and fossils. And you look at that and you go, as the media would say, oh, shocking amount of sediment. Absolutely shocking. Look how much is coming off that construction site. Terrible. It does look bad. But once you start taking measurements, it's a perception you have, not a reality. And as an expert in sediments and floods, I was given a consultancy contract to the Cook Islands. And why did I accept it? Because I had already risen the ranks, I could accept it. I loved, I wanted to go to the Cook Islands and enjoy them. 
And so swimming around there looking at the coral, will the sediment coming off the Cook Islands destroy the coral? And you can see that sediment there uh, on a particular date there. And there's the corals in there. And so I enjoyed a lot of swimming around the corals in the, in the Cook Islands and so on. Absolutely loved it. But let me give you the figures, the actual statistics, because I'm here talking about sediments is a key to understanding the landscapes, but sediment is a key to understanding the fossils, which I'll talk about following. It's the key that links the two together. Let's have a look at these. Whoops, too far. There we go. The majority of fossils on this planet are what type? Anybody know? Which environment would most fossils come from? Marine. But despite decades of monitoring the ocean floors all around the world, what do we find? We find the lowest rate of sedimentation you'd ever imagine. We can get 1 to 50 millimetres in a thousand years. In a thousand years, 50 millimetres. That's hardly going to change a landscape. It's hardly going to create a fossil. 50 millimetres will not fossilise a cockroach. So how come there are billions of fish in perfect capture? So no point on the planet ocean today has a sedimentation rate that would cause fossils or really lead to much landscape change. My biological friend said, come closer into uh, shore. Most of these things would seem to be shore marine. Well, you may not understand what that is. Don't worry about it. It's a Landsat image with a lot of... Uh, uh, manipulation done. This is up in Keppel Bay, Rockhampton is here. You're actually seeing under the water here. And so there's the island out there, here an island and so on. There's the deep ocean with the uh, um, crust there, sorry, the continental shelf there. And what you see here is the sedimentation going on here. It's a different colour. Deliberately we falsified the colour there for you to show you what it is. But it is interesting. You can still see when the ocean was out here during an ice age that the ancient Fitzroy River Channel is still there. So you're telling me that thousands of years later, that original river channel out there on the ocean bed is still intact, hasn't been filled with sediment? In fact, the measurements now show it's about 300 millimetres in a thousand years. That's nothing. That is seriously nothing on a continental shelf. Let's come inland to the floodplains. Floodplain sedimentation rates are also exceptionally low. There's some figures there I haven't indicated. I think the 3.2 was in Fiji and so on. But the largest event found from a floodplain <coughs> over a larger area was 10 centimetres in an event that was about what you'd call a thousand-year flood, and it was found by myself. So it took me to the top. I became famous for finding one of the deepest sediment deposits in a flood, 10 centimetres. That does not excite me. A thousand year flood gives me 10 centimetres? Oh, come on. Thailand found eight centimetres and were hoping to beat me, but they didn't. So I still carry the largest deposition of sediment from a flood over all of that. But I was struggling. By the way, we can date the floodplains quite well. You know what we use? Coke bottles. Have you noticed how Coke bottles change their style over time? And how people used to throw them away? We'd find them at various depths. And you'd look at the Coke bottle style. Oh, yeah, that was introduced in this time. Oh, yeah, that was introduced this time. You could do that. The other technique we used was cigarette butts. Because there was two types of butts, and I've never smoked, so I don't know. But there was one that was... Uh, um, oh, I even forget what they were. But there was an older style of cigarette butt that was phased out. And they became filter-tipped or something like that. The old ones do not decompose. So what we do here is we look for those old butts and when we come to the point there, oh yeah, that's when they're phased out of society. That's the date of that sediment. Isn't it interesting how we can use our own litter to help us? But the point is, where is the sediment supposed to create all these massive landscapes and all these changes and the fossils? So they said to me, tsunamis, that's what you need, Ron, tsunami. Well, guess what? The largest tsunami ever monitored on the planet in Indonesia a few years back gave us a whole 10 centimetres. And you go, what? Surely a tsunami tore the landscape up. No, it didn't. How can you tell? There's people down there. That's a person there, another one there. And there's the boat. That brown there, by the way, 
is grass. It's grass with brown staining on it from the sediment. It didn't even have enough sediment to bury the grass. Isn't that fascinating? The maximum they found was 10 centimetres. Now, did it destroy our buildings? Yes. But did it destroy the trees? Not in the slightest. All the grass, anything. In other words, the landscape is still the same, despite the world's largest tsunami ever monitored. So you could see where my thinking was going. I'm sorry, but all the contemporary processes, all the processes we see today, do not explain this history of a landscape at all. Which then brings us to the fossils. And then we find, okay, fossils require deep and rapid burial. A to create a fossil, you can't just be buried. You have to be buried rapidly and deep. Why? Because you need the pressure and the temperature both have to rise dramatically in order for you to be fossilised. And I'll come back to that in a moment with an experiment that was done. Here's my point. There is a fish, perfectly fossilised. Now when a fish dies, what does it normally do? It floats. It bloats and floats. Then what happens to it? It gets eaten. It gets predated, it rots. But that one is in perfect condition, as many of these billions of fossils are in perfect condition. In other words, it did not die without a mass of sediment burying it instantaneously at an incredible depth to place the pressure and the temperature on it. Yet nowhere in the world was I seeing such examples. And here's a fascinating thing for you. Despite all the work that's been done on the continental shelf and river valleys, did you know that today we find not one fossil is being formed? How come? What that means is that fossils cannot be formed in today's climates, whether it's tropical, arctic, temperate. They were created by something in the past, something that moves sediment at an incredible magnitude. So an assumption is that there's an abundant supply of sediment, which we've proven doesn't exist. So, oops, jumping ahead, go back. Last slide was very good. Try that again. There we go. We see fossils like this. We know it was rapid burial. There is, I uh, don't even know what the species name is. Is it, is it up there? Oh, yeah, some of them. I could never say those names. You know, when I was with paleontologists, and I know there are people who want to be paleontologists. I'm sorry, I can't say the names. Um, mind you, if I really wanted to find a fossil that had no name. I was going to call it Ronicus nilicaritis. But I didn't find one. You'll see there that it's actually giving birth. That's the, that's the child there. There is another one in here and there's one slightly off to the right which is not in the photo. In other words, that was so fast that even during birth, it wasn't a, a case of this animal getting away from the sediment or the water or the flood. It was so fast, it empowered, overcame. Now here's another one. Wonderful example here. Uh, how would you even say that? Struthia mimus. I don't know. But there's something fascinating about that particular one. Notice its neck. It's arched, which is the lack of oxygen. So you'll find birds that are being fossilised have their neck arched backwards like they drowned. Not like you find them on a roadway where they're lying linear. In other words, there are many of these with their neck arched, indicating they drowned. And how do we know they drowned? Well, because there's one with its neck arched and it's buried with a fish. So you're finding land mammals and fish Buried. In other words, that event that put those two together is an incredible event of size. So, where does that lead me? Ah, first though, recent experimental findings have been absolutely stunning to us as Christians. A study done at the University of Queensland tried to look at infant crocodiles. Can they be fossilised? So a student, PhD student, buried infant crocodiles under 20 centimetres of sediment, which is twice more than we've ever recorded in a large scale. And guess what happened? The crocodile bloated and burst out of the sediment. And so the student had to actually then rebury it. Now, I wrote an article on that, and it's actually published in our magazines, one of our magazines. I, I was a bit cheeky, and they wouldn't let me say it. I sort of imagined the student in the laboratory standing on the 
crocodile saying, I want you fossilized, I'm putting pressure on you. But it couldn't be done. It, not, none of that evidence pointed to fossilization. Secondly, back in 2005, I think it was, yes, 25th of March, this particular person had found a big fossil bone that could not be transported, so she had to cut it in half. Cut it in half. That's a crime in paleontology. But when they did, she was stunned to find that inside that bone was red blood cells, basically, or collagen or whatever they call it, and tissues that could be stretched and put back together again. It actually came back into position. That is impossible. How old do they tell you dinosaurs are? When were they created as fossils? How many millions of years ago? 65 is the latest. 65 million. Now, the top biologists on the planet say that in order to have tissue that you could stretch and put back, even in the best laboratory, it would not last more than 10,000 years. In the best laboratory. In nature, it would not last 10,000 years. She was found to be... People said, you're wrong, you got it all wrong. So the Royal Society in London got fed up with her and said, no, we're going to do the crime ourselves, we're going to cut up one of our bones, and this is terrible, we're going to prove you wrong, and guess what they found? Tissues. Many bones have now been cut up and found tissues. Red blood cells. Now they begin to look at dinosaurs, they find eyes, gut contents, everything. That's impossible over 65 million years. In other words, they weren't created then. A more recent experiment, to come back to the pressure and temperature, they decided for 20 years they'd been studying putting lizards and, and uh, leaves under incredible laboratory pressure in an engineering laboratory. They bring two pieces of concrete together, press it overnight, really, really incredible pressure and temperature, and they'd open it up in the morning after 24 hours, and all they found was a mess. And they kept trialling it, didn't work. Then one day, one of them said, well, guess what? We find fossils in sediment. That's where we find them. So let's first of all take this lizard leg, or the whole lizard, wrap it up in sediment, and then put it under pressure. And guess what happened? They pulled it off in 24 hours. They were stunned. They had perfect fossils. Guess what happens under the pressure? Under the pressure... Well, let me, get, let me ask you a question. What are you made of most? Water. Under pressure, the water is forced out of the body. What is left can now fossilise. Otherwise, it decomposes and rots or whatever. It doesn't work. They made a major discovery. So a university in Japan, which has Christian researchers, is now trying to work out how much sediment and how much pressure it would have been. Isn't that fascinating, though? It has to be in sediment. So don't listen to these arguments that the dinosaurs died because of uh, volcanoes or they died because of uh, meteors. Because if, if you were to look at the sediment surrounding a fossil, if you could give me a sample, every sediment has a signature. I could tell you whether it was aeolian, landslide, landslip, volcanic, or whether it came in a flood because a flood sediment has a particular skewness, kurtosis, and so on. I don't have to know where it came from. I could tell you where it came from. And the majority, 99.99% of all fossils are wrapped up in flood sediments. That's how they died. They were flooded under an incredible weight of sediment. So I was left with this sort of thing. The sediment supply rate did not help me understand the landscapes and certainly did not help me understand the fossils at all. The fossils also were not formed millions of years ago. What do the scientists feel about that last point? Well, they've allocated millions of dollars to try and find out how tissues could survive 65 million years. They have not allocated one dollar to maybe suggest that maybe those fossils were not formed 65 million years ago. They have a paradigm and a belief themselves that will not shake them. They will not be shaken away from that. So I came to the conclusion, as a non-Christian, that a global flood did occur. Speaking to all my colleagues again, they all said, yes, Ron, you're correct, we see it ourselves all around the world, but we are not permitted to say this in universities. You are not permitted to publish that in a university paper, in a journal. Did you know that? Because the university uh, and the journals insist that it's all got to be naturalistic. You cannot have any link to the Bible. 
And we've had our papers adjusted because there might have been the slightest hint that it pointed to the Bible and the journal said, no, you can't say that. Isn't that fascinating? There's a complete veto, if you like, on this sort of thing. So, there I was in this situation. How do you find more about that science? Because I'm going to stop the sciencey stuff now. Go to our website. It's got a search engine there. There are 14,000 articles for you to look at and they're all free of charge. Isn't that great? They're written for you. So if you're in high school, university, copy them all you like. We will not charge you with plagiarism. We're going to be very happy if you copy them and use our material. The site is creation.com. What is it called? All right, I'm from academia, and that sort of response would never have satisfied me in academia. I would be down amongst you now. So I'm going to back, I'm just playing my academic role for the moment. What is that site called? Excellent. Did I hear that coming from the front row? Oh, one head's nodding. HD, I'm going to question you. <laughs> okay, creation.com, it's so simple, it's so easy. 14,000 articles sit there, and much, much more sits there as well. How do you get connected to us on a weekly, fortnightly basis? You use these. Simply a scanning mechanism there. What is it? It's simply going to keep you up to date with what's happening in the creation and uh, elements of society that are dealing with what we're dealing with. And so what does it do? You'll get an infobite type um, situation there. What, is it, what does that mean? I use it. Do I read every one of them? No. I read the ones that interest me. But it gives me the most up-to-date information so that when somebody comes up to me and says, oh, did you hear NASA found Kepler too? It's just like Earth. No, that's not what NASA found. We have people who are connected with NASA. That's what they thought they found, but they won't withdraw it now. What they found was a planet rotating too close to the sun. It was completely volcanic, erupting everywhere, and the entire planet was on fire. But you don't hear that. We will publish it immediately. So when somebody comes up to you, and this is very good to connect to other people with your Christian faith, because they can come up to you and say, oh, I heard about Kepler too. There might be another planet like Earth with life on it. And you can go, well, let's catch up for a coffee or a tea and something, because I'd like to show you an article written by a top scientist. Guess where it is? It's on Infobytes available to you, and that person will go, where'd you get that from? Ah, you've just opened the door. Doing a little bit of evangelism, so it's extremely good. Like I said, do I read them all? No, I don't. But there's also social media and all sorts of things there as well. So, here I am now. Because I've been to churches, I went, yes, God said, and behold, I am myself and bringing floodwaters on the earth, which I now believed, but I was taught to teach that those floodwaters only occurred in a small area or a regional area, such as the Black Sea, then I was very, very challenged at that point. I was challenged. And I had a lot of thinking, and I came to the conclusion in the end that there must be a God. And so in university, I began to express that. There must be a God. Well, did I get challenged? I said, but a catastrophic flood did occur. It's scientifically proven. Now, by the way, in the literature today, the scientists will say that a global flood did once occur, but it must have been millions of years ago. Because they now see the evidence that I've seen over many years, it did occur, but they will not accept it occurred more recently. I started to speak this, it got me into trouble, got me into trouble with one particular lady, younger lady who was really challenged, she was an atheist to the core, working in the university in the same institute I was in, and she began to challenge me, and she started asking for proof and, you know, what's going... Now, she thought I was a Christian because I said, I think God exists. Isn't that fascinating? An atheist thinks you're a Christian because you think God exists. Haven't given your life. So she became very annoying. She asked me lots of questions. I couldn't answer them. I said, go read the book. It's what every academic says when they don't know the answer. Go read the book. And so she did. She started reading the Bible. She came back with more questions. I went, what are you reading? And she said, well, I started at the front. I went, you start at the front? No, 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 the Bible's not like that. I knew enough. I said, no, you don't start at the front. You start in the Gospels, in the back there. She walked away going, you Christians are idiots. You won't even read it from the front. But she'd already read Genesis and Numbers and all the rest. And she was wondering why God killed so many people and all this sort of stuff. I had no answers for that. So eventually I started to avoid her. Every time she came one way, I went the other way. Seriously, when you have another person in university challenging you, 
straight to your face. And then one day she said to me, take me to your church. I go, what? I don't have a church, but I didn't want to tell her I didn't. I didn't know what she was saying. It took weeks for me to think about that. I didn't know whether to take her to a church. What? Which church? I'm back in Australia now, by the way. I'd come back after all those years. I was back up on the sunny coast. I don't know what to do. So I eventually decided, oh, we'll go to this church up on the hill in Budrum. I went up there. I won't name it, but I saw everybody walking in, and I said, I'm not going in. Because everybody going in there had those things that they used to support themselves. <laughs> and she said, why aren't we going in? And I said, because if I go in there, I'm in the youth group. <laughs> and she got angry. She started yelling at me. And, you know, and so, you know, I said, look, look, there is a church down the road. It starts half an hour from now. We'll go down there. And guess what? It was just like this. They had a band. They had no colored windows. They had no pews. And she walks in and she goes, what on earth are you doing? This is not a church. I said, yes, it is. And so she sat there during the service. I sat there during the service. Now, you've got to understand, here, an atheist had taken an agnostic person into church. <laughs> How good is our Lord? At the end of that, the pastor said, for those of you who are new here, we're going to ask you to raise your hands if you want to give your life to Christ. So lower your heads, close your eyes, put your hands up. Well, she put her hand up. And guess what? I did too. And she cheated. She decided to open her eyes and she wondered, I wonder what this Christian thinks of me with my hand up. And she saw I had my hand up. She thought, you are one idiot. You are really. I thought you were a Christian. Now you got your hand up. So that day, an atheist took an agnostic into church with no Christian support and we both gave our lives to Christ. Isn't that incredible? That's, yeah, amen indeed. That's how the Lord works. Wait for the clapping. She didn't annoy me anymore. A year and a half later, we were married. <laughs> she sends her love. She can't be here uh, tonight. And uh, she's just come back from Alpha Cru uh, not uh, Alpha Cruises. <laughs> she's come back from ACL. She was part of the training for the download program, helping all those young people grow. And so she's loving doing all that sort of work. So we became, now, did we stay long at university? No, <laughs> that wasn't going to happen. You become a Christian and you're a professor of science, you're not staying at university. <laughs> I won't explain any more, but you're very, uh, you know, kindly removed from the institution. We both were. So, that's how I became a Christian. Wasn't that fascinating? Did I know what to do then? No. Prayed a lot. I didn't know what to do. What am I going to do as a Christian? And uh, put that to thought. But what had happened then is I'd realised how I came to that point, of course, was the sediments, landscapes, all the fossils, whether it's abundance, sorting, rate, distribution, volume, frequency, many parameters I didn't even talk about today, tonight, all pointed to the Bible. So I had to accept it. Had to accept it. And she did too. She was a biologist, absolute atheist. On that day she gave her life, she said, you know what? It all makes sense. All of a sudden it all makes sense. All those anomalies in biology, they're gone. So... Is the book of Genesis important? Let's just switch for a moment. to well, What does all that mean to us? Can I share what it meant to me? It meant the book of Genesis is very important. Which is the same as saying, is the issue of creation important? It is extremely important in this day and age, in the 21st century. And if you want an article that really explores that, just write down the name Lita Sander. Sanders. She's written an article, it's in creation.com, it's free for you. Lita Sanders, an incredible article where she links the book of Genesis to all the other books in the Bible. And that is an incredible article where you'll see the connectivity and the importance of the book of Genesis to the entire Bible because it's the foundation of the Bible. So I'll go back. That's Lita Sanders. I know a few of you are taking a photograph there. Okay. So, why is the book of Genesis important? Let me give you a few stats to see if you're aware of it. Now, I'm an academic, so I studied the Bible intensely after I became a Christian. What do you find? Every New Testament author either eludes or quotes from the book of Genesis. Did you know that? Throughout the entire New Testament, every book, every author refers to or alludes to the book of Genesis. Number two, all of those authors in the New Testament refer to the book of Genesis as a historical document. Not an idea, not a make-believe, not a Mesopotamic faith or religion, a historical document. That's extremely important to us to understand its history. Jesus Christ said it was history because he linked Noah's flood to his own return, did he not? 
He looked at the lifestyle there and the lifestyle upon his return, etc. He made the connection. He accepted the flood. Yet many Christians today don't. In which case I'm asking, are you challenging Moses who wrote about it? Or are you challenging Christ who said it did occur? Who are you challenging? Notice the difference too. In the early church preaching, when Peter and those are out there and they're particularly speaking to the Jews, they use Jewish history and Abrahamic and Davidic promises were very prominent speaking to the Jewish population. But what happened when Paul and others then started speaking to the Gentiles, those who are not Jew? Have a look at what he speaks about. You're going to be stunned, I think. He focused heavily on creation as the foundation, did he not? Isn't that incredible? Why? Because these people didn't know who Jesus was. They'd never heard of him. And so he went back to the very question that plagues all of us. Who am I? Why am I here? The very questions I went through in life. Today, that is so important in the 21st century. The majority of people under the age of 35 have never heard the word Jesus outside of a profanity. So what are the groups out there doing? I've met numerous evangelical groups out on the streets on the Sunshine Coast and elsewhere. Guess what they're talking about? Creation. Who are you? Where did you come from? Who created you? Guess what? The young people will stop and listen. If you say, I'm here to speak to you about Jesus Christ, they go, no, I'm not interested. They keep walking. Isn't that interesting? I find that the 21st century doesn't differ that much from the 1st century when Paul was out there. I think we face a very similar environment. If we think our culture is predominantly Christian, well, they might put that way in stats, but I don't think we're behaving that way as a culture. The book of Genesis is challenged today. This is what I want to end up on. The problem is that the book of Genesis is challenged, not by atheists. It's being challenged by us as Christians in the 21st century. How do I know it? Because I got to read most books on Genesis in a pastoral library once. Unfortunately, as a Baptist myself, it wasn't a Baptist pastoral library. It was another denomination. I could not find one book on Genesis in an entire rack that said Genesis was true. It all said it was not true. Here we have one that says Genesis reflects creation stories and cosmologies from Egypt, which all the academics who are non-Christian in England and Cambridge and Oxford say that's completely not true. It is not based on that. Yet we seem to think it is. Why was I in this library, by the way? Because I had a massive tumour in the brain. Certified I'd be dead within two weeks. I was taken to Wesley. They didn't think I'd make it. They even had to take me out of the hospital because I was so vulnerable. And what they did in the end, you can have a look at me a little bit closer later, they had to cut my head in half. They had to peel my face off. They won't give me the photos. I want to know what I look like as a fossil. I was under the operation for 11 hours. It was a miracle recovery. I am now being studied by a PhD at University of Queensland. Why am I being studied? Because the Lord, what he did to me, was absolutely miraculous from our perspective. For him, it was standard. He gave me a purpose, a purpose in serving I see these things here. Another book that says the flood didn't occur, the ark is not real, the flood story is not a past event. Oh, a theologian telling me that. When I've been travelling the entire world and I saw the opposite. You get people like Steve Chalk who says down the bottom, far from being infallible, it's flawed. Talking about the Bible. Creation and the fall of Adam and Eve is not history, it's a myth. He speaks at churches across England, convincing people that all of these are stories John Walton's book, you'll find in every Kurong store, you'll find it in every library on the lost world of the flood. He claims, as an Old Testament theologian, that it never happened. I thought, you're kidding me. You know nothing about the physical. He doesn't talk about the physical or the, you know, the sediments, the landscape. He just said, no, it didn't happen. It couldn't have happened. And that is so prominent in our society today. We are being infiltrated with false teachers, left, right and centre. And John Walton has been written up as a false teacher, yet his book is found in every theological library. I'm stunned that we accept these sort of people in our journey. They've changed that 
image of Eden to this image of Eden. That it was not all about a creation, it's a creation based on death and disease and suffering over billions of years beforehand. And that we didn't sin, we didn't bring the pain and suffering in this world, it was already there. That is taught in churches across Australia. It is taught by many Christians. What effect these challenges have, just to wrap up, so you're aware of how important this is to me, and I hope I'm expressing this to you, how we must be always on guard and growing ourselves, our hearts and our minds on this. Number one, Jesus becomes redundant. If you accept evolution and all the rest of the story, he becomes redundant, unnecessary. Who summarised that the best? It was Frank Zindler. Don't even bother reading that. He said simply, if there never was an Adam and Eve, there was no sin. If there was no sin, there is no need for salvation. If there is no need for salvation, you do not need a saviour. Therefore, Jesus Christ is redundant. He summarises that better than any Christian ever could. That's powerful. And we fall for it. We don't understand why we're being challenged. Number two, people leave the church. We have seen the greatest loss in Christians in the Western world since the 1950s. Why? Because you're going to get people like politicians who grew up as a Christian, who said, you know, no, nah, I found out we don't have to rely on the concept of a supreme supernatural being. It happened naturally over millions of years. That's a politician saying it publicly. Then you get filmmakers, the one who made Farlap, that movie, saying, oh, I heard the theory of evolution and it cured me of any idea that God created us and that we're God's children. These people are out there publicly saying it and what's happening? It's across the media everywhere. And so people are listening to that and walking away from the church. Whoops, back. People are uncertain of joining the church. Why? Because in the very education system we have, whether it's from kindergarten onwards, they are going to be taught something else. It's in every movie, every radio station, basically, except the Christian ones. And so here's a study done of people in a scripture class and a survey said, of the top four questions that these young people were asking, one of them was, doesn't evolution prove that God doesn't exist? In other words, they're already embedded in it. You need to understand that your children, your grandchildren, your nieces, nephews, they're every moment of the day hearing the other story, not the Christian story, not the Christian message, rather. Little wonder we lose over 70 to 80% in universities. They go to university as Christians and they're torn apart. We lose 70 to 80%. They may come back later, but much of their life becomes unproductive as they wander away from Christ. Get that. It's just somebody coming to us here mind saying, thank you so much for your magazine. Finally, we are left with uncertainty. And this is a very powerful image. What does it mean, uncertainty? Here it is. What does the book of Genesis say? It says, there is a creator. There was a law laid down. We would obey it. Did we obey it? No, we did not. We sinned. Will we be judged for that sin? Yes, we will be. Because there was a law, there was a creator. We will be judged. But already in the book of Genesis, God has already taken steps to redeem us. And he already starts to lay out a pattern for us, which is the Saviour. Here's the point. The whole purpose of atheism and the whole purpose of the false teachers, if you read a lot about false teachers, read what they're saying, they're all attacking the Creator and the very process of creation. Why? Because they take the Creator out of the picture. That's what they're trying to do. And if you are without a Creator then do you have a law? No. Could you commit sin? No. And so what are you left with when you take the Creator out? That's why the target is to take the Creator out. You are left with nothing. That's the problem we face. So the application to us then, Jesus and the apostles all relied on the structure and the biblical history to provide a very foundation to all of their teaching. It's accepted that the book of Genesis is correct. For you, I'm sure your pastor has told you many times, and like many of us, we're not always paying attention. We should be reading our Bible daily, constantly praying, constantly discussing these issues like evolution and you know, Old Testament theologists that say it didn't happen. Or we should be discussing that with our pastors, our elders, our leaders, and so on. And to help you do that, the reason I'm here as well 
is to give you support materials which are out there. That is our number one selling book around the planet. 60 basic questions I think there are simply written for anybody. Teenagers can read this and understand. Why are the 60 questions? They're the questions you get asked as a Christian. If you're not sure, say you'll catch up with them tomorrow for a coffee and you rush home and you read that particular two page, three page in this book. So if somebody said to you, well if you're a Christian, then who did Cain marry? If you're uncertain, go and buy the book. That's the trick. This has got all those questions, and you're absolutely right. <laughs> if you didn't hear that, you'll have to speak to that lady there, or come later. Um, this book was written recently to help those going to university. It's recommended for those who want to go to university to read a little bit of this, and I'm also happy to talk to any people who are going to university and struggling. I've done it many times, caught up with coffee with the parents and the student to really talk this through, because I have, what I have seen in university is the most disgraceful behaviour for Christians I have ever seen. It just, just breaks your heart, to be honest. That's a great one if you're getting more serious and you want to look more of the actual um, um, theology and so on. But two others I've got here. One, we weren't supposed to have this here today, but we have, which is really good. It's the last copies, basically, of the Defending Genesis. We are 40 years old, Creation Ministries, and so what we did was we took the best articles over 40 years in our magazine, re-digitised them, re-edited them, published them as one of the most magnificent coffee table books you'll ever get. And this brings people to Christ. You just leave this on your coffee table at home. People will pick it up and go, wow. There's a number of copies out there. They weren't supposed to be here. This is your one chance to get a hold of that particular book. It is a, that is a gift or something you'll place on your coffee table. And finally, this magazine number one, I can't stress this. 40-year-old magazine, the longest reigning magazine on creation on the planet. It's distributed around the world in so many countries. It's translated into so many languages. My Finnish is not good enough to translate it, but it is translated by Finns. It's translated by um, um, Guangdonghua people, Cantonese people in China. It's translated all around the world. This thing is incredible. It's balanced in every issue. There is something on the topic I'm talking about, there's something on astrology, or astronomy rather, astronomy, there's something on biology, there is a children's section, there is a theological section, there's all of them in every issue. It's an incredible, incredible book. I'm not asking you, I'm not suggesting that you buy it for yourself. You buy it for yourself and you read it. You know what you're going to do with it then? Yep, I'm in the coffee club. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I want a double shot cappuccino, which is what I love. Yeah. Oh, by the way, have you ever seen this? That title attracts everybody because it doesn't look religious. And they go, no. Oh, look, I've read it. Would you like it? The test was done with a thousand of them given away. I think 95% were given away without any questions asked. And people have written to us, so many people have said, I couldn't believe this, even in a prison. I read it, I gave my life to Christ. Because it deals with creation, it deals with a creator. It defines who you are, which is the struggle I had for most of my life. And to finalise how important that is, there's a little cartoon that I've knocked together there. When my wife Julie went to download, even Martin Isles was stunned with what happened. They recognised her name as a CMI person connected to CMI, the name Nella. And they said, are you? Yeah. And so they started buzzing around her. So many. And then in one of the talks, one of the speakers said over billions of years, the entire youth group went into chaos. They stood up and said, that's not true. It's not true. And they were caught off guard. And so later, they asked the question, where did you get that from? How did, what do you, how did you understand 6,000 years? And they said, oh, it's in the Creation magazine. Now, we would not even touch 10% of the market. Not even that. wouldn't even be 5%. It would be so small. Yet, on that day, they were asked, how many of you had this when you were growing up? And guess what? Over 50% of the room put their hand up. They are the ones there trying to become strong Christians, learning to be Christians, powerful Christians, hoping to set up their lives. And guess what? Over 50%, they were not signed up to it. Their parents simply had it. And over their years of growth, they loved it. 
So here we are, right at the end, the Father says, see that rainbow? It reminds us God will never again destroy the earth with a flood. And the young boy, who's been to a normal university and uh, has never seen this magazine, answers, really? My professor says that Noah's flood was confined to the Middle East. But those who were actually raised with this sitting around them or just on the desk, this would have been his answer. Yes, but how come my professors can't see that a global flood did once occur? <clears throat> the end result of this, Julie's family, atheistic, my family, alcoholic, 50% have come to Christ. We simply signed them up. Were they all happy with it to start with? No, <laughs> but they started to read it. We signed them up or we gave them copies all the time. 50% came to Christ. That's why it's so important for us to follow in some way. There's so many resources. Talk to the team. Talk to me. Quite happy to share with you. Thank you.